sort of just the examples of the uh, next yeah. steps that your corporate clients are taking. Yeah. So. Um, the steps are taken uh, very tremendously. Everything from setting up special funds. So we have oil and gas clients that uh, sp set up special energy efficiency funds. And these funds are dedicated to energy efficiency projects which have a very hard time competing for capital okay versus say drilling a well so this is stepping outside the box and putting in place a uh, uh, 10 million 50 million dollars where those are allocated and can go to projects that use uh, that meet a lower hurdle rate i.e. not as great a, a return on investment that's one uh, two is uh, CN has uh, launched a uh, waste management waste reduction plan across Canada on all its yards and they set up eco champions in each of the yards to identify areas to reduce waste, to reduce water, to reduce energy. Okay. Um, three is um, First Capital has instituted a policy where they will build only lead silver or greater energy efficiency buildings. These are the guys who build all the box stores. Okay. So there's a variety of things. Everything from change in behavior, education and outreach, to investing in new technology, uh, to energy efficiency programs. It varies tremendously. Tremendously. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about for companies that don't have enough money? Do you work with the government to provide incentive? Yeah, so sometimes... Um, what we will do is, uh, let me take an example, we're working with a big uh, university right now, okay? Uh, so money's tight, and one of the things we're helping them do is identify funding potential so they can leverage the funding to build uh, a more energy efficiency new building, as an example. Uh, so we'll go out and help them identify things that they can leverage. The other is, is we try to partner with firms so a green mining initiative we're doing. We're working with mining companies and helping them identify uh, technologies that we know well and uh, that uh, the company is called Sustainable Development Technology Canada. It's like an investment portfolio. And they've got 200 uh, technologies. So we're helping them identify where those technologies can go into the mining companies and then get financed and leveraged. So, yeah. So uh, the problem, as you described it, is fairly obvious that we've got uh, an excessive volume of release of CO2 gases right now that we continue to put in the atmosphere, and we're functioning at 392 parts per million right now, which I guess is beyond the 350 limit that everybody talks about positive feedback systems affecting ongoing climate change. Climate yeah. change starts to drive climate change. Yeah. So if, in reference to energy production, if the reality is that we need to produce energy on mass now with reliability of supply, where do you, how do you think we should be embracing or viewing nuclear energy as a means of doing something? Someone asks me that every time. I should have known that was going to be you, Blair. <laughs> um, so, I, with all answers, okay, with all answers, there's lots of context around it. So, when I answer, I'm not giving you the full context. However, if we continue on the same demand driven need, i.e., if we want to use as much energy as we want to now or do now, I believe we're going to have to have nuclear as a transitional fuel. On saying that, I think we can probably surpass some of that or bypass it just like we are with coal by reducing our need and putting more investment into technology but as Blair knows that technology takes years and years to come to commercialization so so I do believe nuclear has to be a transitional uh, generation uh, for greenhouse gases there are lots of other problems with that I'm not saying that's not the case however yep a question Perhaps on behalf of some of the students here in sort of a career tra trajectory, when you look at industry and you see sustainability in action, is it best performed having a, a VP of sustainability or some senior level or C level sort of be that person, the sustainability person, or is it better to have sort of sort of entrenched within the various divisions or units and, and not have one person that sort of has that portfolio? Well, so. 
So it's better to have it entrenched across the organization. On saying that though, you have to have C-level buy-in. The fact of the matter is, I'll give you a couple examples. We have two very large clients, CN I can talk about, CN, who had a CEO that wasn't really up on sustainability. It wasn't on his radar, he was an operations guy. New CEO came in, very much on his mind, and they've transformed what they're doing and what they're able to do. You have to be able to get the CFO, the CEO, the executive B VPs on board, or, the, or a board member, and a very strong board member, board driving it down. But you have to get that at some point. On saying that, I have seen and worked with a number of companies where it has started at the grassroots. One of my first uh, jobs, I started a company right out of school and waste auditing was the big deal there and I went into a pipe fitting company and the secretary of one of the VPs had started a waste reduction program on paper and had convinced her boss that she needed to hire, they needed to hire someone to do a waste audit of the bigger area. He didn't think this was a good idea. She actually put together a business case for him to show how much waste they were throwing out. Long story short, we came in, saved them tens of thousands of dollars. That program became a huge waste reduction program. It actually helped them. Um, later on, I interviewed the guy and he said that helped them negotiate their next contract because before the waste reduction program, they had a very us and them with union and management. After the waste reduction, because they had to work together so closely, they got to know each other better. The negotiations went smoother than any other time in its history. So, interesting correlation. Yep. It's always developed with the future. The last, uh, I remember when I was your age, there was a couple of wrong with the guys in the next 50 years. I wonder how they're placed there. The, the, sorry, say that again? Wrong. The, oh, the Club of Rome, yeah, yeah. Actually, they had a, uh, an update report, and my understanding was they were on track with pretty well everything that they had predicted, other than the timing. And so if you look at the biological degradation, you look at greenhouse gases, they're all on projection. Um, the timing was off. I think they had said in 25 years, and now it's 30, but the projections are, are on board, yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and, and I'm not saying it's doom, I'm not saying it's doomsday, I'm just saying we're in for a rough ride, for one. And two is, it, unless someone can debate this, it's, it's a finite earth, right? Like it's a confined space, we're doing lots of stuff to it. It's kind of like bacteria on a petri dish, you only have so much space. At some point we will run into that uh, limit unless we make significant changes. It, it, it's just the laws of physics. <laughs> like it's, you know, so that's all I'm saying. But I'm not saying there's a doomsday because I believe humans have an, uh, an incredible be ability for innovation and change. Yeah. I wonder, maybe you can explain why there's absolutely no kind of willingness to pay because it will come with cost. Yeah. We have to do the invest in. And I do that, do this student there's a study that says if you put on five cents per liter of gas, mm -hmm. you, would, you could invest, invest it in a way that it, it's carbon neutral. Yeah. Right? It's carbon. Yeah. Even then, if I have 130 students and ask who would pay the five cents, mm. maybe 10 percent if yeah. I'm happy. And that's an environment and business, so these are already yeah. into the environment. So in, in other businesses as well, is, well like, do you have any idea how yeah. to which this. Yeah, my, my feeling is is that I'm a real believer in, in regulation and, and, I, and I, it's kind of funny given that I'm a fiscal conservative. But anyway, what I mean by this is that, and what I've watched over 20 years is that companies will operate within the framework they're giving. Right now the framework is we don't pay for carbon, so why am I going to pay? Like why would I disadvantage myself, right? So then you look to the leadership of the government, right, to create policy to uh, do things for the betterment of society. The challenge is, is politically, 
they, they cannot wrap their hand, or, uh, you know, they can't wrap their hands around this. And what I mean, let's take a simple example, is uh, the Green Energy Act. This is, uh, there are flaws in it, and I'm not saying that, but this is a great idea to just get innovation going, get some green power going, etc., cetera, uh, from a number of areas. The first thing everybody jumps on is the cost or increase in electricity, even though a recent paper I, I read was it represented 0.1% of the increase in our costs. It's actually the infrastructure retrofit to the, the nuclear facilities and so forth. So, so this is where the political system is broken down, i.e. you've got these four-year windows and no one wants to look 30 years out, right? And they keep saying it's going to cost us more. But I'll contend and argue to I'm blue in the face that it's going to cost us a lot more if we don't do anything. And people are already seeing that now. I have clients who had, you know, an oil and gas client who had all their wells and production off for 14 days because of the flooding up in uh, Lloyd Minster. Did that not cost them money? I think it did, <laughs> right? But no one, do you think the forest uh, industry in BC is happy with 80% of their stock gone, right? Agricultural droughts, right? And these are not, the difference is, at least again, from my readings, you guys go out and read, from my readings, these events are not in the norm anymore. Okay, so the tornadoes hitting down south this, uh, just this past week, tornadoes may happen in January, they tend to happen very infrequently, and when you get sustained winds, for as long as you did, creating record breaking, i.e. they never measured sustained winds for that long, Right? It's outside the norm. It's, right? So things are changing and they're going to cause damage, especially when we're population increases and so forth. Yeah? If you confine yourself to the corporate sector and the decision making inside the corporate sector, what are one or two or three levers that come to mind, either from work you've done or mm -hmm. observed somewhere else, that turns the decision anchor around? making sustainability equals profitability. What is it that you need to do to, to, to get to that? Yeah. The, that? The, the ones that we tend to focus on are, um, there are several, but one is cost savings. That sometimes is harder when you get into the, the social aspect and that, but it's quite easy in a lot of cases for energy efficiency and innovation and that. Two is, is the brand. So Keystone's a great example where companies are not recognizing this change or movement in public thinking. And this, this potential risk, okay, to them. Um, uh, one big company, you know, is getting slammed for the fracking of gas, right, right now? And that's a huge hit on their brand and, a, and a, an impact on the bottom line. That's what uh, companies listen to. Okay. The other is, which is interesting, is coming up, and I mentioned it a few times, is, is HR. That's been a harder one to pitch, but the, pro, the, the key is, is that the VP of HR is now getting more and more requests from young people about what the company is doing. Uh, the final one, in some cases, in, is investors. And this one's a real hit and miss. This one really hits home. So one of our clients, I told a story this morning uh, where I got a call from the manager, then the director and the VP within the day, all asking me about the GHG strategy we had developed in our forecasting for greenhouse gas emissions because the investor who was ready to put a billion dollars into the company wanted to make sure the company had uh, plans to mitigate the potential liability or risk of those emissions. So. But you have, to, you have to put it in business context. I do not go into CEOs or boardroom level and debate the science. It's a no-win situation. It's a no-win situation with them because they, need, they talk money. Uh, yeah. Just a comment, when I hear you, these words out of your mouth, it sounds to me like that little snowball sitting there at the top of the hill. Yeah. And it's, things are really changing fast. And circles that are pretty slow to I, I think it is in some circles. In other circles, that snowball sort of rolled back a bit, you know, in the political realm, yeah. you know. So there are a few that are definitely, and it's going to be interesting to see the younger generation and, and the, you know, the outfall of Keystone and see where that goes if this movement uh, continues, so. 
Yep. Uh, with respect to the government policy, what have been uh, the most effective drivers that you've seen? Because it seems like when we have restrictive policy, um, we end up with situations like the Kyoto Protocol, which we yep. get ducked out of, and then it sort of takes the punch out of the yeah. entire situation. And then yeah. there's there's subsidization of like bioethanol, which almost inflates uh, un economically unfeasible yep. industries. So have you seen one uh, policy going any which way? Or well, <laughs> every single policy, this is the challenge, right? We're into new areas. And so what we've seen is that uh, as soon as you enter into that new area, people are projecting what might happen based on a policy. And biofuels is a great one where it actually didn't do what it was supposed to do, right? It, it sort of incentivized other areas. However, um, those regulatory mechanisms, I believe, that provide, so there's two answers. One is, I think a carbon tax just hitting a carbon tax, it makes it simple for everybody because it hits us. That's politically unfavorable though, so not going to happen. So next is regulatory uh, mechanisms that provide some flexibility uh, for uh, industry to move capital in the most efficient way. So cap and trade is one example, okay, where our low carbon fuel standard is another, where you can have companies invest capital in one area where it's more efficient and be able to sell those credits to another who can't invest that capital. Now, I'm going to throw a wrench in and say, however, when we put in the knocks and socks, it was a regulatory, thou must do this. And Blair, how much innovation did we get in the utility and mining space? It was phenomenal. And you have now VPs of environment who back then were fighting tooth and nail that regulation and are now presenting at conferences and saying how much money they saved. So again, business will work as long as you give them a framework. It's got to be a framework in which they can work and then let them innovate. So. Yeah. One more? Okay, yeah. One more question. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of focus on companies. Mm -hmm. How come there are no organizations that target us? to try to change our behavior? Well, there are, like, that's why I showed you that climate reality project. That's, that's what we, we trained uh, a number of people. I think there were 275 across Canada, nurses, doctors, engineers, et cetera, to go out and do what I do and present to you. We're now running a pilot project for university students up in Ottawa where we're going to develop a presentation uh, for university students to give to universities to try to educate people. So there are, there are efforts out there. A lot of the end goes too, if you go to WWF or Suzuki or that, they have programs for the individual. So. How well are universities doing? Let's say there's 100 and, I don't know, 20, 30 universities in Canada, whatever they are. Well, you were just, there was just a ranking on some of them, right? And I think Concordia came third or fourth in North America. Uh, there's a few, put it this way, it's like a pyramid. There's a few good ones at the top, there's a bunch in the middle that are starting and trying, and then there's a bunch at the bottom that's it's not there yet. Although it's interesting because we're even, we just did a, a sustainability strategy for Vancouver Community College, like, right? And so interesting, it's coming, it's coming. Great. Yeah. Thanks everyone, I appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>